Hey everybody, welcome to Adobe Live. My name is Anika and I will be your host today. A happy new year to everyone joining us. We have Sam Peterson in the house. Hey Sam, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Anika? I'm doing good. Uh, how are the holidays? They've been good. I've been uh, relaxing a lot, so now I'm kind of jumping back into the, the swing of work. Awesome. So uh, I hear you've, you're going to work on storyboard animation today. That's exciting. Yeah, we're going to be doing some uh, something that's a little bit new to me, which is going to be storyboarding out some images, and we're going to be choosing one frame from one of those images and working it up a bit on stream. I'm excited. Uh, I have been through all of your animation and storyboarding for the past projects. I'm really excited to see what we get into today. But before we dive into it, um, thank you so much for joining us, everybody who's been joining us after the Photoshop Daily Creative Challenge with Voodoo Val earlier today. She, I think, did a intro for social bio which is pretty exciting so if you guys haven't seen it go ahead and check it out it is every day at 9 a.m pacific so go ahead check the challenges out and you can also go ahead and put your challenge entries in the discord make sure to do that and uh sam for anyone who's just joining us for the first time would you like to introduce yourself a little bit showcase some of the work and what we're diving into today yeah, my name is Sam Peterson. Um, I do a lot of streaming. You guys may have seen me here on Behance a little bit and I also in the chat all the time. Um, I've been streaming for about five or six years, so I do that a lot. Uh, I primarily do concept art and fantasy illustration. And just recently, I've been trying something a little bit different, which is working on a animation project. And I've never done anything like that before. Um, I've never done any animation or comics or any sequential art. So it's kind of been a new thing, but I wanted to share that with you guys today. Um, if you want to see my work, you can follow me on Instagram, uh, Behance, of course. Um, those are probably some of the best places to see my stuff. I'm just Sam Peterson Art everywhere online. Uh, so check that out if you want to see some of my work. A lot of it's just like character portraits, but I've been doing a little bit more like illustrative work lately. So since I actually have a decent amount to show you guys, I'll just show you that today. So yeah. That's exciting. I want to say hi to everybody in the chat. We have Rick, we have Monica, we have Wade and Randall. Hey, Sean, how is everybody doing? Thanks for joining us. <laughs> hey, everybody. Let's go ahead and um, look at some of your work then. Rick says, uh, Pete Samerson, it's just Sam Peterson today. I'm sorry, Rick, sorry to disappoint. <laughs> Maybe next time. Yeah, it's just Pete Samerson. <laughs> Ryan in the house. All right. Uh, do you want to start with maybe showing us what you were working on earlier and then dive into what we're doing today? Yeah, exactly. That sounds good to me. Let me uh, bring up some of the images from the first animation that I did. And this will kind of give you an idea of what we're shooting for, for what I'm working on today. Um, yeah. So previously I had a, the, the first animation that we were doing, it's just called like the Necromancer. And it's not 100% done. I was hoping to have the finished thing to show you guys today, but I'll show you some of the images that I've done for it so you can kind of see the illustration project I've been up to lately. Um, I think there's like 11 of these frames, but this is something I've been working on for a couple months, just learning the process. And I actually learned a little 3D for this, um, just a lot of experimentation and figuring out a workflow. This animation, I love it. <laughs> it's really goofy and at the same time, it's so fun. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, I, I enjoy doing something a little bit like silly because usually my stuff's, I don't know, it's, it's usually just straightforward concept art, character art, uh, but this has yeah. been a lot of fun. So I'll actually play the uh, little animatic for you guys. Um, this is the storyboard and this is kind of how I've been laying them out. And this has been a sort of... Um, a new process for me. So I'm kind of figuring it out as I go, but I'm using artboards within Photoshop to do this. And I'll show you a little bit of that today, but this is basically the layout for that. And let me pop up the actual animation that 
the animator just sent me like this morning. Um, it's still not done. There's still voice lines and art that needs to be replaced, but uh, hopefully you get the, the picture. The council said it couldn't be done. They thought me insane. Even the Undying Lord declared you a fool, Zarin. Ha! But we knew better. Yes. Finally, the time has come <laughs> to rise, my minion, rise! <laughs> I wish he wouldn't do that every time he makes a souffle. It does smell pretty good, though, right? Oh, absolutely. Is that sage? Aye. Diabolical. So that's kind of the uh, the first little experiment that we've gotten into. That's awesome. I love the head bob uh, with the skeletons, the characters with the skeletons. Yeah. The head bob is everything. <laughs> yeah, he like that was one shot that he actually had the pieces for, so he's able to animate a bit. I, I like the little when the hand goes up, little sound effect. Yeah. So diabolical. Uh, everybody's <laughs> loving, uh, loving it. Anthony Jackson wants Fresco to have art boards. And um, Ryan loves it. Love it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think I see Sean saying our artboard's new to Sam. I've, I, I'm aware of them and I've kind of like played around with them before, but I've never actually used them in any practical way. So this is kind of the first time I was like, oh, artboards would be perfect for this. So yeah. that is the first animation, not 100% done. Uh, we do have a YouTube channel up, but we don't have anything posted. So if you guys follow me on social media, um, you'll be able to kind of get note when I when we actually put the finished thing up since some things need tweaking. But that was the first one. Um, and I wanted to show you today the second one we're doing. So this is uh, this is called Innocent Monsters. It's basically another little silly gag, but this is something I've done the past couple streams. So this is what this storyboard looks like compared to this one. If we if we zoom out. It's a little bit more involved, um, a lot of repeat shots, but yeah. uh, we're gonna be working on a shot from this today. And this is the one I chose with two little kobolds. Ooh, that's exciting. Um, we have any questions in the chat? I don't think we do. Sean asks if you use After Effects. Um, I have in the past. Um, I haven't really done anything extensively in After Effects for, for quite some time. Um, I might do it a little bit here with video editing, but for the most part, no. Okay, awesome. And I want to remind everybody that if you're watching this on YouTube, hop on over to Behance. We are at be.net slash Adobe Live. This is where I can relay all your questions to Sam if you have any, and you can also engage with the community. So don't forget to do that. And let's dive into it, Sam. Let's do it. Yeah, I was I was wondering, should I give you guys context for what the script is? I mean, if should we just jump into this? Basically, there's two kobolds here, and I thought this would be a good shot to do. But if you guys want to know the the brief outline of this, I could go over the script. Um, oh yeah, let's let's do it. I guess so you, people would be more interested in learning what the story is all about. Yeah, you can kind of see what I'm shooting for, I guess. So I'm just gonna go through this real quick, but first shot is a fade in of an exterior of a forest clearing at a cave entrance with two kobolds. Uh, Crud and Plek are the name of the kobolds and they're sharpening spears hanging outside the cave. Um, Crud says, I'm going to, I'm going to try to scroll through this as the script goes. Uh, I've been thinking, oh yeah, I know we talked about it already, but I really want to go to the Underdark Gala this year. Boy, this again, what? I think it'd be fun. And then it cuts to a shot of these guys creeping through the woods, this adventuring party. And, uh, he says, shh, look, foul beasts guard the cavern entrance. Just as the barkeep foretold, this must be the place. Can you understand what they're saying? I know the wretched warble of evil when I hear it, old chum. Ready your bow. He notches his bow here, says, with pleasure. And then it cuts back to them talking. Uh, the gal is going to be nothing but spider demon worshipping drow, eldritch horror fish people, and those creepy underground dwarves. And he says, Drugar, they're harmless. They make armor that stabs themselves in the brain on purpose. It's a cultural thing. Like I said, creepy. Okay, now you're just being ignorant. And then he says, hey, uh, are those guys staring at us? He says, you're changing the subject. Look. And then it cuts back to this. And they're hiding there off in the forest. 
And he, uh, he says they're probably just lost, calls to the adventurers, waving his hunting tool back and forth. There's going to be a little arm wave there. Uh, I th and then he says, I think they see us. And um, from this point of view, basically, the kobolds are talking to them, but they just hear these like crazy kobold language that they don't understand. So it just seems very aggressive waving the tool. And he says, we may have lost the element of surprise, but we will never lose the element of righteousness. Strike true. That's the point there. So I basically indicate um, animation changes within the same frame with the horizontal shots. I don't know if this is a normal way to do it. This has been my little method, and so far it's worked pretty well. So then it's yeah. him wave, waving the tool back and forth, and he says, hello, do you need direction? And then interrupted by an arrow flying by, a flaming arrow that sticks into the cave entrance behind them. Um, and it's basically them shouting, hey, what's your problem? Are you insane? You can't just go around shooting people. And then it cuts back to the adventurers again. They just hear these warbled yelling of kobolds. And he says, they seek to hex us with their cursed tongues. And he says, we shall cut them out. And he pulls out his knife. And he says, uh, tally ho. And then it's basically the last shot of them running at them. And they just say, I swear the neighborhood goes to hell whenever they build a new tavern. And that's the whole thing. So that is pretty <laughs> sweet. Hopefully that gives you guys some context. So it's kind of long. Um, but that's the new script. I think it should be fun, a uh, lot to do. And I kind of wanted to break down right before we jump into it now, we're gonna get going. Uh, I wanted to break down the sort of process that I've come up with. So yeah, I've- we, we have a few questions in the chat regarding that as well. So once you go through that, if you miss anything, I'll bring them up. Yeah, definitely ask away. Um, so this is kind of what I've done. Phase one, phase two, phase three. So phase one is what you just saw, uh, minus the shapes that I have down. It's basic napkin doodles with some values thrown on top. Phase two is the color and lighting block in where I, I work up the sketch roughly. I put flat colors and then I throw on some uh, different blending modes to get some light and shadow. Typically multiply layer for shadow, color dodge for light, and then like a linear dodge for rim light. And then phase three is just polishing it up, finishing it up. So that's it. Um, this is where we are now more or less but we're gonna see how far we can get today if we can get somewhere around this phase two with this shot. That's so. awesome. Um, we have a question asking, what size are the artboards that you use for the drawings? Um, the artboard, I think it's, let's see. I just used something that was decently sized. So it's 1200 by 675. Um, and if you see here, you can check artboards. There's a little checkbox if you're unfamiliar with how they work. Click create. And what you can do from here, is on top of the move tool, uh, you'll see V here. If you click and hold on it, you'll get the artboard tool. And if you have the artboard selected, the actual artboard panel here on the right side under layers, you'll get these little plus icons. So you can add artboards below it. You can add them horizontally. And then you can just select whatever artboard you wanna build off of and you can break it off that way. It's also really nice because you can click and drag it and rearrange them. So there's been times where I had to swap artboards just because I, you know, once you get sketching, you kind of realize like, oh, this would work better here or we need to add in this shot. So you can just grab them and, and kind of move them and rearrange them. So really helpful in that way. Yeah. Um, everybody's interested in learning. Let's get into it and then I'll just relay all the questions to you. Yeah, that sounds great. So what awesome. I got here is I'm taking the very, very rough like napkin sketch that I did. Um, this is the background. I'm just keeping all my layers separate. These are the characters and then these are their costumes. So I'm going to maybe spend um, the first half of the stream working online. I think that will be the goal. Maybe we'll design the the costumes a little bit. And then um, towards the second half, we'll, we'll throw some color, throw some lighting. It's going to be really rough, but hopefully you'll kind of get the idea of what we're what we're shooting for. Yeah, amazing. And uh, Blair, yes, Sam is doing all of this in Photoshop and nothing else for now. Correct, yeah. The animation's done in After Effects. Um, yeah. I should mention that I'm collaborating with two people. One is named Cinderblock Sally. You can find him on TikTok. And he is the primarily the writer of the group. And then there is Double Crit Fail. He's also on TikTok and he is the one doing the animating in After Effects. Awesome. Just 
just organizing these here. All right. Oh, yeah. I like to always name your list. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's not a big deal when you have like four layers, but oh my gosh, when it gets when it gets up there, it, it becomes a huge chore. So I try to name everything, group things off the bat um, early on. So I got my background lines, character lines, costume, and even, you know, I'll group that control G and do um, just lines because we're going to be doing colors and everything and it's going to get kind of messy otherwise. So I like to stay organized the best I can. OG layers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Got my weird system. Yeah. Um... I guess we have covered most of the questions. Okay. But if you guys have any other questions while Sam is working, I will be able to distract him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is what free. I've been doing until now. But yeah, go ahead and type those into the chat. <laughs> and I'm going to actually take my um, my document. I just copied it, but it's at 1920 by 1080. And sometimes I'll leave it like that. But if I need more resolution, I'll just scale it up as I go. So we'll leave it like this for now and uh, go from there. Oops, that's not where I want that. It's amazing to see the line work and the roughs initially, and then what it comes to in the end. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun um, seeing this whole process kind of like evolve since, like I said, I haven't done this before. So watching it come together and um, kind of like be animated, especially that's that's a really big payoff. So I'm super excited to actually finish the first one. But uh, I'm having a lot of fun jumping into the second one already. Like I've noticed just this whole discovery part of storyboarding out very loose is, is a lot of fun for me. Yeah. So Crud and Plek are supposed to have kind of like piecemeal armor. Like they've, you know, found things here and there. So I'm, I have this on the costume layer where it's separate from the body, but I'm just going to kind of sketch around with different shapes make his armor look like it was scavenged and, you know, fashioned out of makeshift items. So that's kind of the goal here going into this. And since we have a limited amount of time, I'll probably focus on one, but you know, we'll see, see what we can sketch out for both of them. Awesome. Um, and I just want to confirm you work at 300 DPI, right? Yeah. I always work at 300 DPI. Awesome. Yeah. Always make sure if you want to print it, um, I always work at 300 BPI. It's a little taxing on your machine, but it's just good to be safe. Yeah, and it kind of depends like what, you know, size you're working at. I just always keep yeah. it as 300 by standard, but I like to um, work at slightly smaller resolutions or, or dimensions, I should say, off the bat. Um, and if I need to, I'll scale it up because, you know, when you scale it up, you lose a little bit of quality, a little bit of resolution, but it doesn't matter at this phase when everything's super rough because everything's going to be repainted and redrawn. Um, so if you are working on a big image and it's taxing on your system, uh, that can be kind of a solution. Yeah, pro tip right here. <laughs> yeah, I did that when I was working on a, a giant dragon illustration from from the beginning. Like there's so many layers so early and so much going on that you know I kept it fairly low and that was my computer appreciated that. But, but I did end up, I did end up uh, upgrading my CPU like halfway through that illustration. So, oh, for it, sure, scaling up. <laughs> yeah, it needed it. Um, we have a question in the chat from Laura. Laura asks, "What's your process for coming up with the script before you sketch?" Um, that is a good question. I had a document full of a few different ideas because I wanted to do something like this before I met that group. And yeah. um, then I realized that talking to them shortly after we met on TikTok, that they had a very similar idea. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. I wrote down a bunch of ideas that maybe we could go through. So the Necromancer and those, the Innocent Monster one, those were both like really rough ideas I had. And then um, Cinderblock Sally, the, the writer, he went through and actually fleshed out the script. So a lot of it is his process since he's the main writer and he took these and made them like fully fleshed out all the dialogue and he did a really good job. But for me, it was just thinking of like silly ideas that, oh, this was in a and d, d game. Actually, this literally came because I was playing d, &D some some year or two ago and we went into a cave and my group just like, I think the mage or the, the wizard 
shot a fireball at all these kobolds. And I was kind of thinking like, did they deserve that? Like they were just kind of <laughs> hanging out in the cave and I had to have my party reassure me that they were evil and I felt <laughs> bad. And it kind of, that was kind of the basis for this idea. It's like, what if, you know, D&D monsters are just trying to live their lives and all these adventurers are going around being self-righteous and ruining their day. So it, it's just like a very snippet of an idea. And then I'm like, oh, well, it'd be kind of funny if, you know, maybe they're just hanging out and they get hassled by these adventurers. So it's a very loose idea, but in terms of writing the script and fleshing it out, I'm bad at that. And I'm glad he likes it and is good at it because it's a weakness of mine. Yeah, I guess that's the that's the um, fun part about working in a team that everybody covers each other's domains. Yeah, and it's been cool to see that too, because like there's been a lot of times where I'm like, hey, you're really good at the things I'm bad at. That's uh, that's so <laughs> convenient. Yeah. So it's nice. Yeah, to everybody that. plays to their strengths. Yeah. And it, it's nice to be able to just focus on, you know, what I really like doing and what I'm, I feel like I'm more proficient at. Absolutely. Love it. Um, are we working on the line work right now or the costumes? What you said? Uh, yeah, yeah. So I'm trying to doodle out kind of a rough idea. I'm not so much trying to make the costume really structurally like, you know, proper in terms of perspective and all that. But I'm like, okay, does he have like some leather wraps on his wrists? Does he have like a, a metal bracer? And so I, I try to do that as quickly as I can. You see everything that I do is very much just rough ideas. So from the get go with the the sketches, like this, this is the kobold standing in front of the cave <laughs> entrance. It's just like yeah. two bean a shapes blob. or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I only kind of flesh it out once I know, okay, that's working pretty well compositionally. But um, it's very much like kind of symbol drawing, you know, just very rough things. Like this is supposed to be a mage in the background. So the pointy hat and then the blob body. Um, and that's kind of the same thing just at a different level here is I'm like, all right, does he have a bracer? What is, might that look like? It could be like, you know, a thick one that goes into a taper. It could be, uh, it could have like fur hanging off the edge. And it's just indicating it really roughly to see does that, does that even like work on a very basic level? And if not, I haven't committed like 15 minutes drawing that thing. Awesome. Yeah, I saw a question there from Daryl about storyboarding. Uh, so do you create like a top-down map of the scene when you storyboard for planning the cameras and the character positions? No, not really. Um, kind of like an, like an aerial shot or something to plan out where everything's um, I arranged. Think I think they're referring to just the storyboarding that you showed us earlier, like a mm -hmm. top down map where you go in from scene one to two and then horizontal where you just move within the scene. I think that's what they're referring to. So yes, I think Daryl, I think that's what we did. Yeah. Um, I mostly, when I approach this, try to like visualize it cinematically. Um, I don't really have any background with film or, you know, comics or anything like that, but it's like when I read the script, I kind of picture it like you would see it in a movie. Oh, like I can imagine the camera swooping around here or it'd be like a really low camera angle with like light, you know, under lighting if it's the spooky effect that we're going for. Um, so I try to just visualize it roughly and then doodle out that idea. It's not like I'm doodling the visual that I see in my head, but I'm like, okay, I kind of picture this, you know, part where they're talking being a closer cropped in shot of um of like their upper bodies so then i i just indicate that real quick i'll be like okay so maybe it would look like this and the first shots of them talking i thought it might work as a full body shot because they're kind of being watched um yeah so i think it's really just imagining if this was in a movie what might that look like yeah that makes sense but a lot of this stuff is just figuring it out as i go because i'm i'm new to it all and I think that's the fun part of it. Just embrace that. It's like, yeah, we're figuring it out as we go. That's a lot of fun. Yeah, always uh, just diving straight into it with painting. I've seen your work directly with paint and like just color blocking with other sketch, which is also mm -hmm. pretty exciting. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's kind of fun to try different methods and experiment around with, I don't know, trying to find something that works best for me. Yeah. 
So you're using a Cintiq, if I'm not wrong, right? Uh, no, I'm actually, I used to use a Cintiq, but I'm using a Wacom Intuos Medium. It's not even like the Intuos Pro, um, just the okay. medium. I can probably hold it up here. Uh, just this kind of little, little tablet. I have a Cintiq. It is an older model Cintiq, so it's not like, you know, one of the newest, latest and greatest, but uh, it's been sitting in my closet for a while. <laughs> Um, oh, so this one doesn't have a screen. Uh, does that affect you? How does that affect your workflow? Do you find that you're faster without a screen? Um, I feel like I can use either one. If, if it's put in front of me, I'll get used to it. The, the small things I like about this are, I like painting a lot. You know, I focus more on painting almost, uh, I'd say than drawing in my work. Um, that's the thing I enjoy the most. So it's nice being able to do like big brush strokes um yeah. without your hand obscuring it it's not an issue when you're drawing in, in line you know it's just this tiny little uh, mark that you're making right where the pen touches but when you're doing large brush strokes your hand kind of obscures it a little bit so i like being able to see the whole thing i'm painting as i'm making these you know kind of large brush strokes and roughing yeah. things in um it's also easy to do kind of have like a loose sketchy style fairly easy on these with small movements i kind of like that it encourage me encourages me to not like tighten up too much but to keep it kind of kind of loose so minor things but yeah. yeah i guess it's just about getting used to what we're doing i mean i've never worked with something without a screen so i guess it would be difficult okay. for me like just blindly drawing <laughs> it'd be like a blind contour drawing for me <laughs> yeah and i i think that's kind of the thing with a lot of these is like these tablets are fairly odd when you first get them. I don't know if anyone um, recently got a tablet, but I feel like it takes, you know, it took me maybe a week, but I was drawing like all the time when I first got it and I didn't really have anything to compare it to. I didn't really paint before I got my tablet, um, okay. but it takes some people like a month or two to get used to depending on how much you use it. And it is an awkward feeling at first. So if anyone gets one and you're like, this feels unnatural, I mean, yeah, I think it does for most people because no one is used to drawing on the table while looking at a screen. Yeah, it feels natural, unnatural, and it's natural. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's why a screen tablet, I think, is, uh, I don't know, people are able to pick those up easier because it's a lot more yeah. what we're used to drawing with pencil and paper. Yeah, Cody Bear also uses the Intuos, Go Intuos theme. <laughs> nice, yeah. I also like the idea that, well, if my tablet ever dies, it's easy to replace where, whereas a Cintiq, yeah. it's a, it's a big, big deal. <laughs> Those things are not cheap. Yeah, for sure. Um, the Huion uh, variants as well for people who are interested, I think. Those are good yeah. ones. Yeah, I've heard good things. I haven't used them myself, but people Yeah, I think Mercurial like uses it. I'm not oh, sure. Okay. Yeah, she seems to like it. And the kitty drawings are turning nice, so <laughs> I'm guessing it's good. Um, do you have any top three to five tips when it comes to character animation, fam? Um, character animation, um, not really animation since I'm so so new to it. Like this whole process is kind of an experiment, but it, it's really not that far removed from illustration for me. Uh, since we're we're not doing frame by frame animation, even that I would feel like I wouldn't feel completely lost because I'm used to drawing like different poses and trying to think how weight works within a character and how they position their body in different circumstances. But um, I mean, I have I would say I have my tips for for like drawing and digital painting, but not so much character animation. At least yet, yeah. maybe maybe as I do more, I'll learn more. Yeah, again, just about getting used to what we're doing. But I feel like yeah. uh, the way that you've learned Blender in like two days is <laughs> is amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess um, if you guys saw those first shots from the, the beginning of the stream when I showed the Necromancer animation, the tower and the laboratory, I learned Blender for those... Uh, for those shots i haven't really done 3d extensively before i have dabbled in it here and there but i i kind of tried to pick up that as quickly as i could so i could use it for those shots to make my life easier and it, it was nice it definitely helped 
Yeah, I mean, getting the perspective right in 3D is, I mean, definitely for me, it's easier than painting it. <laughs> yeah, and it it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't even just perspective, even though that's a really big tricky one, especially with like the tower with all the little shapes and everything. But like yeah. the lighting and the, uh, when I put textures down, it, it made the coloring a lot easier. So it was, um, it was definitely a worthwhile experiment, even if I didn't want to use it. And I thought this isn't worthwhile. This, you know, isn't going to make my workflow easier. Yeah, I think it's still good to experiment and learn new things and try new things. That's always, you know, a worthwhile investment. But with all those things in place, I was like, wow, this actually made the painting come along pretty quickly. So it was nice. Yeah. Um, I believe there was another question about the tablets. Yeah. Uh, do you find it hard for the hand-eye coordination? Again, other than getting used to it, uh, do you have any tips? for the chat? Uh, Hand-eye coordination, I would just say use it frequently. The more you use it, the more you're gonna get, you know, comfortable with how it works. I, I remember hearing when I got my tablet, people saying, try using it just for like normal computer usage, normal internet browsing, use it instead of your mouse, essentially. Um, that could work, could be useful, but I, uh, yeah. I just, I was drawing like all the time when I got it. I think I was kind of obsessed. Uh, this was way back in like 2009 is when I got my tablet and it was just like, oh, this is the coolest thing ever. So I, I think I was probably blind to any like awkward feeling that I, I had or would have had. Yeah. I guess it's just similar to learning Blender, right? How we're, I mean, I'm still intimidated by using, like learning it. And, but I know that once I get into it and do it like a few times, I will be able to do it. It's just about like yeah. getting into it. Yeah, I agree. And I think my outlook for anything now is if I do it every day for X amount of weeks, I'll get it. And I feel like that's just made learning anything not intimidating and not easy because there's still all the struggles that you have to go through and there's still all the figuring it out. But I think sometimes the hardest thing about learning new software or new skill is we build it up in our head like, oh, what if I fail? Or am I going to be good enough? Or how difficult is this going to be? Whereas nowadays I'm just like, oh, this should be fun. Let's, you know, if I mess around with this every day, um, I'll get it. Like I'll figure it out. And that's kind of how it was with 3D. Like it's going to be tough in the beginning. It's supposed to be. But if I just make sure I chip away at it every day in, in you know, a month or so, I'll be like, oh, okay. I kind of have a good idea for how it works now. And that's how it works every yeah. time, you know, no matter the subject. So I guess I've lost the, that intimidation factor, which is good because yeah. I feel like the fear of failure is kind of the killer of creativity. It's like it kind of keeps you from doing really fun, cool things sometimes. Or oh yeah, for sure. 2022 goals for me. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Just jump into it. Yeah, just get right into it. Ryan mentions how it's infuriating to not knowing shortcuts and like the commands when you're learning a new software. <laughs> yeah, I remember that on stream. I remember specifically <laughs> being like, man, I bet if I knew all the shortcuts, this would be so much faster. Because I was, yeah. I, I don't know if you were ever there when I was doing it, but I remember on stream, I would be like, all right, so press G and then <laughs> Z. And I was. Then I move it up <laughs> and then I press shift A. And then we can make like, and it's like, I could tell, I could tell that like, this would be so fast if I actually had these, the muscle memory memorized and yeah, yeah. I got it. I got a lot more now though. So that's good. Wade's like, I just use my mouse with my left hand and stylus in my right. Same here. <laughs> I just use my mouse with my right hand and uh, the touchpad with the left. So I'm like zooming in with my left hand. And using the mouse with my right. <laughs> Got to get into that flow. For sure. It is really nice when you've used programs for a while, though, and you can, like, you can tell you're just, like, your hands are just firing and you don't even have to think about it. And just all the hotkeys are memorized. And also, if you guys don't use hotkeys or memorize them, oh, my gosh. It makes life so much easier. Highly recommend it. Yeah, for sure. Sometimes I forget what the the tool is called because I just remember the hotkey. And I'm like, hey, so you just try press H on the keyboard. That's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't even, 
Yeah, a lot of it's mem muscle memory for me. So sometimes if I have to think about like what the shortcut is or where something is, I'm like kind of have to open up the program and check real quick. <laughs> Just automatic sometimes. Oh yeah, and now there's this. Oh, that reminds me. Uh, after Max, I think there's this search menu in. I think I think it's there in Illustrator. I don't know about Photoshop. Mm -hmm. that you can discover and find the tools where they are because sometimes we just tend to forget. Oh yeah, right there. Yeah, it's control F, just like, you know, you would try yeah. to find something on on um, a browser. So yeah. if you need a if you need a certain tool like oil paint maybe, like the oil paint filter, you can see that it's filter stylized yeah. and it, it'll kind of direct you to where things are, which is really handy. So awesome. yeah, pro tip right there. That's very, it saved me a few times. I'm like, oh, where's this thing again? Something like yeah. obscure that I don't use. And it's like, oh yeah, I can just do control F. Yeah, it's funny how that was available in Mac um, earlier than it was in the Windows machines. And it recently got launched for the Windows machines as well. Really oh yeah. Fun. Also uh, command S. Oh, someone says most important hotkey, control S. <laughs> Let's do it, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the reminder. Thank you, Cartier. Thank you. Can't forget that. that. The yeah. fear strikes into you pretty hard. Like if your computer lags or has a big lag spike and you're like, when was the last time I controlled us? <laughs> yeah. Do the save, uh, sip and stretch, you guys. Yeah. Words the to good live old. by. Definitely. <laughs> so you can see I'm, uh, I'm keeping it really loose here. Everything's very... Um, sketchy and rough and i i try to do this or i guess this is one of my digital painting tips but what i try to do is determine if an image is working or not as early as possible and i do that by doing everything really rough so in the past maybe i would do like really finished line work um and then i wouldn't realize later on like my composition is bad or my the cut something is fundamentally broken but i spent all the time on like oh nice line work got to finish the line work so what i try to do now is everything's rough the sketch is rough the mask is rough the flat colors are rough the lighting layers are rough and that way if anything's wrong or fundamentally needs to be changed it's super easy because at no one stage did i spend really long and invest a lot of time into anything it's just like everything's very rough and i can adjust it very easily so I think that keeps um, it keeps it more fun for me because I, I like jumping around a bit, but it's also nice to be able to see the picture and be like, this is pretty much what it's going to look like finished. And uh, that's what I tried to do. Let me see when I was talking about the process phase Yeah. here, like everything. This didn't take that long to do, honestly, but the difference from here to here isn't that huge. You can see. It already looks like the finished thing. It's just more refined. Um, yeah, the detailing around around the things. Yeah, and sometimes that detailing takes like longer than that whole first step did. So it's good to get everything blocked in pretty roughly. And actually, I think the next step for these past the like sort of napkin doodle phase is compositionally. Now, now some. Some images are really straightforward and you don't really have to think like if it's going to work compositionally, but this is like a really rough example of what I might do next, just seeing if the shapes work value wise. So you can see like the character in front is going to have more contrast and then the character behind them is faded a little bit so that they read on top of each other, but that character still reads on the lighter background. So it's like dark shapes on a light background all around. Yeah. And compositionally, it's it's much, you know, I can see if this is working or not from like a very early rough phase. And if those shapes just aren't reading, uh, I'm going to have to change them. But obviously, that's pretty easy to do at this stage. So it's kind of what I'm going yeah. for. Definitely love it. Um, we have a few questions in the chat. I know there was one about transforming and flipping horizontally. And I think Wade already answered that. But the question is, I'm seeing that you can constantly transform and flip horizontal. Is that to mitigate your being right-handed or left-handed and thus balance the favor of one or the other? Um, That that might be it. That's an interesting way of putting it. It's just yeah. flipping the canvas is good in general because we all tend to yeah, skew things one way or the other. The other thing is when you flip an image, your, your brain is kind of seeing it fresh. It's seeing it new um, from a different perspective. 
So a lot of times when I flip things, I'll realize like, oh, the legs are kind of askew. Maybe the, the posture of the body needs to be changed. This leg looks off. Something looks fairly skewed and it's, it's easier to fix it here. Like when I look at this, I feel like I might need to adjust the legs. Um, yeah, I love how you just like leaned out of your chair to like <laughs> zoom, <laughs> zoom out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe if I tilt my head just right, yeah. I'll see it. Always works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Like a lot of this stuff is just so uh, muscle memory. I don't even think about it. But um, yeah, I flip a lot. I think it's good to do pretty frequently because it's a bummer when you spend a while on a sketch and you're like, oh, man, I just flipped and everything looks off. Why? <laughs> yeah, it always happens to me with eyes. I'm like, oh, the oh, eye yeah. looks wonky now. <laughs> yeah. I think the eyes are like the classic one. If you're doing a portrait and you flip and you're like, okay, well that's, yeah. that's wrong. Um, yeah, do you it's... work with page templates when creating storyboards to share with others? I don't know what page that means. Page templates. I'm not, I'm not too sure. Um, I'm not familiar with that. No. Is that, is that like a um, common practice in, in, uh, let's let's uh, Christina if you could elaborate a little bit on that that will be great let's see I'm gonna google it real quick I don't yeah, do storyboarding I mean, so I have my no um yeah this is like my first shot at it so this is this is a process that very well may change I should preface that this is not like a pro storyboarder pro animators workflow this is Sam the illustrator and concept artist dipping his toes into uh into storyboarding and animation and this is the method that i came up with that works for me because first what i did was i opened a single document in photoshop and then yeah. i made a bunch of shapes for panels and then i used those shapes as clipping masks where i clipped things to them and then i quickly realized you can't rearrange things that way and there's a million layers that you you would have to like be able to cut out for each panel to move it and it was just like there's no way so then i was like oh yeah artboards are a thing um Annika, I actually feel like maybe you were the one in my stream who mentioned like something with artboards because that sounds yeah. familiar. And then uh, yeah, I remember the first idea. stream you were figuring out artboards. I'm like, hmm, nice. Yeah, and it it's uh, it's it been a life... journey. Yeah, <laughs> it's been a lot of fun. There's been a lot of lessons learned, and um, I'm still getting the feel for it. So you know, the workflow for this whole process may change. The way I structure storyboards may change, but. So far, it's uh, it seems to be working quite well. Yeah, I think uh, the template was basically just the same idea, but having like a basic template, just as you would with anything else. Mm. And looks like you answered their question, so that's awesome. Thank you. That is awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, this has kind of been the uh, the process lately. But if there's um, if there's any sort of like situation where you know I, I would have a set template or anything you know that very well could could happen if i need to reuse the same things and we have another question uh do you have any tips on making perspective or using perspective grids do you use grids in photoshop um i don't i've used different perspective tools like third-party perspective tools over the years but um a lot of times I, I do sort of like not a, a strict perspective grid, but something more just implied. So for example, if I'm doing a character here, I might do something like this. Where I'm like, all right, his feet are planted here. You know, maybe like that. And then like, where is his shoulders gonna be? So there's this, you know, this kind of like vanishing point uh, situation going here where there's like this rough, rough guide. So I'll do that a lot. Or if I'm drawing a, a pillar next to them, or maybe there's like a cement block or something, um, I'll try to, you know, get some idea of like, where's the, the eye level in this scene. The more complex it gets, the more I'll be inclined to actually figure out the perspective because you start putting a bunch of different objects in a scene and the perspective is looking wrong um it, it's good to be able to check it and be like all right so where is my vanishing point actually and what is going on with this um 
but that's only if it really calls for it. If I'm just sketching like a block here that, you know, maybe he was sitting on using as a chair, I'll probably just eyeball it. Yeah, that makes sense. I feel like those uh, vanishing point, like looking at the vanishing point and just imagining where it is, is a great tip. That really yeah. sets the precedence. Yeah, and I think it's a good exercise to kind of just practice um, yeah. drawing, you know, 3D shapes in space because that's kind of what all drawing is. Even if it's just like these organic forms, I'm still thinking about them as blocks. You can actually see when I sketch this, yeah. uh, it's, a, it's a cube for the body. So I, I could get the orientation of his shoulder correct. So, and then I do a cube for the hips because it helps me um, orientate like where their torso is facing or where their legs will be facing. So I do that a lot when I'm sketching and actually his head is kind of the same thing. Um, it's kind of a wedge shape, so you're not really going to see it. But if I wanted to rotate his head in different orientations, I might do this type of thing. Oh yeah, that makes sense. So it, it really helps me. They have like weird complex heads. Um, but like if he looks at the camera, I need to know how to do that. So like if his nose is here, you know, if I wanted him to look straight at the camera, it would be something more like, you know, that. It's a lot easier to draw a very simple wedge, um, you know, than, this, than this. like a full lizard head in different orientations. <laughs> Yeah, this reminds me of my engineering drawing classes in school. We used to have like top down and like side facing and all of those um, views that we had to draw. So I think it's just about imagining and that is why references really help. I feel like if I wanted to draw something and like I would just have it in person with me and looking at it from all the views can really help with that. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's just super helpful. Um, if anyone's like learning to draw or you know trying to get better at it, to be able to visualize things as 3D objects and and rotate them in space. And what you'll probably come to find, as as I have and many people have, is doing things in the most simple shapes possible first is is a lifesaver. So, you know, all these limbs and stuff I just think is cylinders. Yeah. Just don't start with the sphere, you guys. <laughs> it's the same from every direction. Yeah. Except the top view would be a circle. So. <laughs> yeah, or if if you do a sphere, like if I do a, sometimes I do a rib cage, kind of do yeah. like those those center lines, so you at least understand, you know, where it's coming from. Then you can put the neck in there, and cylinders kind of, well, cylinders pretty helpful, but I like to draw form lines on things a lot. So if I'm doing cylinders. You can see how rough this is because uh, I just try to get the idea of something, but like, you know, the form lines for the cylinder. So I know which direction the arm's going. So if I'm drawing an arm going off in space, it might look like that. But these form lines really help push like, okay, that's going away from us. Yeah. And if you can just get used to thinking like this, you know, it makes makes drawing anything become just a, a matter of knowing the basic shapes that make it up. So I've done this before, but I don't remember how to draw a horse. But if I wanted to go and learn to draw a horse, I'd get a picture of a horse and I would break down the shapes that I'm seeing in the most simple shapes I can. So I think I remember the body being like this kind of curved cylinder like this, you know, it's just this big cylindrical shape. And then like the shoulder, I forget which way it tilts. There's like a tilt to it. I'm gonna say it's it's this way. It is this way. Of course it is this way. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then it's just like, I think there's like three joints, you know, there's kind of like something like that. And then the back thigh. So it's just like breaking everything down into simple shapes. And you know, if you do that a million times, like if you draw horses all the time, you're gonna get pretty familiar with the basic structure of a horse from various angles. And I'd like to think that's kind of where I am with the human body. Um, but you know, it's a, it's a never ending process. 
Yeah, awesome. Um, I I know a lot of people are just joining us. Um, thank you so much for joining us. So we are just working with Sam Peterson here, and he's working on a storyboard animation project. Um, if you're on YouTube, hop on over to Behance. We are at be dot net slash Adobe Live. We have Evan Abrams in the house. We have Megan joining us. We have Steve Garrett. All of the friends. Thank you so much. Hey, friends. How are you? Welcome in, everybody. So I don't know if anyone in chat has any ideas on what should distinguish these two characters because that's a big thing I think about. Um, I don't want two kobolds that look the same, and you guys may have seen that from this image where these are two minions of the necromancer, but I didn't yeah. want them to look the same. One was a zombie, one was a skeleton, but um, you know I made this one taller this one blockier and more hunched trying to like visually distinguish them so i gotta think of some ideas whoops keep uh selecting the artboard tool yeah. somehow did we save <laughs> yeah we saved. i think we a saved. little bit ago luckily yeah, control z helps me too <laughs> i just saved again yeah. just in case awesome yeah uh, wade agrees anatomy study is a constant process practice makes it better for sure yeah so what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to select both character layers, control J, and then hide the original two, and I'm going to merge these two. So I like to keep the body and the armor separate, uh, but I can always go back to these layers if I need to. Um, this way I can start grabbing it, and I do this a lot where I use the warp tool. So if something looks a little off, you know, maybe I'll just do warp. I actually have that hot key because I use it so frequently. Might push him forward a little bit. Can bring the legs down. And, um, whoops. See if I, I think uh, go back and forth there. Yeah, I feel like I've uh, noticed this is like a classic Sam Peterson character pose. Yeah, yeah. A lot of standard standing poses. Yeah, along with maroon and gold. Don't forget that. Oh, man. <laughs> I may have to fight that urge. <laughs> um, which reminds me, how do, you pick, how do you pick colors for these? Do you have like something in mind already? Or do you, do you go as like just during the process, you figure out what colors you want? Um, I think I usually have a vague idea. Sometimes, yeah, there, there might be a case where I'm like really not sure at all. Uh, but I know these guys are standing outside a cavern entrance. Um, I know they're kobolds, so I have an, a rough idea uh, of what that looks like. Um, I think part of it I'm going to have to kind of figure it out as I go, because I know Cinder Blocks Alley, the writer, he was mentioning he had a little description uh, on what they look like here on the script. It, it's pretty brief, but it says, uh, let's see. Well, he said basically more like dog lizard people than dragon people. And that's kind of how I picture kobolds. If anyone's not familiar with D&D kobolds, I kind of, this is, I feel like the classic look for me where they're, they're still dragony looking, but they kind of have that, I don't know, longer snout, less like a blocky dragon face. Um, they're wearing piecemeal ratty light armor and spears made from bone. So I got to keep that in mind. Maybe like we'll have, you know, little things sticking off the spear, decorative bits and Maybe the spear itself is kind of, kind of like gnarled looking or, or, you know, curved from pieces they found. I don't want this stuff to look like it was, you know, forged with, uh, with a lot of skill. <laughs> but um, yeah. he mentioned that uh, lean and scrawny and he said in colorful. He said, not sure if kobolds normally are colorful, but I think it's cooler if they are. So one thing that popped into my head was well, what if one of these kobolds is colorful and another one is more like uh, earth tones? That might be a great way to distinguish them rather than relying specifically on shape. Yeah, we have uh, a suggestion from chat. We have a lot of suggestions from chat about how you can make them different. Clever says, make one base color plus pink. <laughs> That's okay. one direction to go with it. Um, we have Darina saying maybe add some details to the outfit of the one on the left or to his face. Okay, that could be done. Yeah, um, we, um, costume distinguishing could be a good way yeah. to go. 
Yeah, for sure. And Wade's like red and gold, buff and bold. Sam's character mantra. <laughs> for sure. I'm With a lean and scrawny does it. <laughs> for sure. But a good one at that. It's a uh, good let's reputation. See. Well, we got like an hour left. So, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe like the horns could be different. This guy could try to, if they're like more curved. Um, we could try colors. Something with a costume could certainly be different. Yeah, I feel like armor can be something that distinguishes them. Um, and definitely the colors. Yeah, I feel like they would both, you know, kind of have like this leather and cloth and that kind of thing, this sort of like loincloth thing. But I was wondering if maybe the top part could be distinguished more like... I don't know, one has shoulder pads and, you know, all this stuff around the collar. Maybe if yeah. the other one had something that was noticeably different, like a caveman sash or something, toga thing, I'm not sure. So that's something I'll have to play around with. But since we have a limited amount of time, um, I think we'll leave that implied and we'll jump into the, to the rough colors. Yeah, let's do it. Um, uh, more suggestions in the chat. I love it. Love it. Um, we have more suggestions. Perhaps number two can take on more of a, I don't know how to say that, but a crocodile body type. Mm. <laughs> um, Evan says like the very colorful Agama lizard. Maybe a scar on the eye. Okay. A lot of them. Agama lizard. Okay. Whenever people throw out like specific animal names, I always yeah, have I have no idea. Up. Let's pretend I knew that. <laughs> Oh, it's uh, oh. it's blue and orange. Okay. Yeah, that is fun. That is definitely fun. I like that. Um, That's actually a really yeah. cool reference. Yeah, because it'll include the colorful um thing we had about the characters as well. Thank you, Evan, as always, coming in. And I was thinking maybe if one has a a more thin face, someone actually said a uh, crocodile. I I think, but um. Yeah. Have you seen those crocodiles that have like the really, really thin mouths? I don't know if they're specifically crocodiles, but like the difference between alligator heads and crocodile heads, you know, something yep. with the yeah. the stockiness of it. So we could try like making this, let me make sure these are on the right layer. Could try making his muzzle a little bit um, shorter and a little bit more blocky. Whereas this guy could have like a longer thin face. That could be kind of a fun way to go about it. And now I don't know if these characters are ever going to reoccur. They're just two kobolds, right? Um, we're kind of doing like little stories throughout this fantasy world. So the the necromancer, he's certainly going to be used again because I love this character and, and we already have like a backstory for him and stuff going on. But these are just two placeholder kobolds. Um, but still, I think it's good to go into this stuff with an idea of like, what would make a compelling character design? So yeah, something like that. Um, I could make the one on the right even thinner since we kind of have that like thin face motif, you know, maybe this one being a little bit more muscular, but still thin. And this one just being kind of like a little bit more scrawny maybe. That could be, could be a good contrast. So it's like, these are all things to think about. Their costume, how could that contrast their, their body type, their coloration? It's all potential um, ideas. Yeah, I feel like working around those and with respect to the script is really something that needs to be worked out and like thought about while, while we do this. Yeah, and I, I actually spent a good amount of time um, concepting out the necromancer i i don't think i actually updated it to my behance i really need to do that but the i made like a concept sheet for the necromancer i did his head i did a whole sh sheet of thumbnails for costumes yeah. and uh if i did that with every character i'd probably you know spend ages even more on these but i think what i'll do is you know just kind of go back and forth with how i'm designing and um try different sketches like this and if i don't like this I'll try another one but at least give it a little bit of time to doodle around on it and see what i like 
Do you have that on your art station? I'm trying to find it. Oh, I found it. I yeah, I believe I do. Okay, awesome. And I'll just put it in the chat. Yeah, yeah. So that was um there was some preliminary like learning time that went into the first uh storyboard, the first animation and one was concepting out the character, another was learning 3D. And I'm hoping this one since I've already learned some of the same lessons open this one will maybe not be quite as long um i don't know if we can repeat it but for people who are just joining in we do have a script so if you missed it you can mm. watch the replay but if we do get time in a little while we can go back to it and maybe maybe do voices again <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah if you missed it i would i think i showed it pretty early on i think i showed yeah. the necromancer images then i showed the necromancer animatic and then if you see a shot in the stream where i'm going through this i'm probably doing the reading um so if you kind of want to see the subject matter that that should only take a couple minutes oh yeah go right ahead and scrub through <laughs> it's we'll worth wait it here. totally totally worth it i yeah. thought it would be good to have some context cuz oh yeah and sam did voices so worth <laughs> it <laughs> All right. So this is kind of a, a rough idea, but yeah. we can go ahead and try this with the the color and um lighting so I can at least talk about that. Last thing I want to do is maybe just widen his head. I'm excited oh, I like to that. see. Oh, and that is fun. <laughs> it, it just kind of pushing that blocky look for this guy. Yeah, that reminds you of the skeleton head bob. the minion head bob <laughs> a little bit a little bit of pre animation all right so i'm going to copy these and this is what i mean like you'll see me warp things you'll see me change the size of things and transform them and all this makes it a lot easier to get the idea i want without being like well i spent so long on drawing that head and now i'm warping it so it's just like be messy with it doesn't matter I feel All like right. this is the first time I've seen you rotate your artboard. I don't oh, think I've yeah. ever seen you done that. <laughs> I do it, but not nearly as much as uh as I do for like flipping the canvas. Yeah. But yeah, I think their poses look okay. Um something about the legs on the one on the right isn't isn't quite working for me, but you know, these are these are always things I can change at any point. I'm just going to grab it with the lasso tool, uh do warp again and Um I have warp hotkey but I believe it's edit transform warp. So if anyone doesn't use warp uh you can see I have it hotkey to F4. I don't know why I don't remember why I did that one but just having it hotkey somewhere is saves me a lot of time. Oh yeah, whatever works for you. Then I'll um, grab this leg and try the same thing. Wade wants to know if you if you have a series of these planned or is this just one at a time sort of a thing with the scripts that we're doing. Yeah, so the I mean the the idea is to have this be a thing that we do regularly. Um you know if people like it. So I was saying that we should probably get like three scripts out or so uh before we I don't know really really do anything different or, or change course. um just so we can get a good feel for like what's the process and do people like this at all and is this worth you know worth it to keep doing but i think everyone in the group it seems pretty excited about it yeah. um i think for me it was actually a big part of something i've been looking for for a while because a couple of years ago i was really trying to find the answer to like what do i want to be making i i guess more of a profound like what is my art supposed to be and what do i want to do with it like long term because i think for so long my goal was just to get better at art and to learn how to draw and paint and i didn't think as much about like uh what do i want to create which is i think the opposite route a lot of people take but i kind of found art again when i was 21 and i was trying to figure out what i wanted to do and i kind of rediscovered art you know i hadn't done it in high school or middle school and i i was doing it when i was in elementary school was probably the last time and um i kind of rediscovered it when i was 21 in community college as i was trying to figure out what i wanted to do 
And I had this, this thought of like, okay, this is what I'm doing, but I feel like I'm really behind because there's all these people who are like, like 15. Like I was on an art community at the time. And I remember this, this uh, one kid who was like 14 at the time. And there's people who was like 15, 16, and they're just killing it. And their stuff's so good. Um, and I was like, man, I got to catch up. So I was so focused on just like learning the technical side of drawing and painting. So some years back, I really got this uh, sort of dilemma of like, what do I want to do? I've, I've been drawing and painting for a while now. And of course you never stop getting better, but like, I need to kind of figure out what's, what do I actually want to create? Like, what's my thing? So yeah. I think I've, I've kind of discovered that the past couple of years, I have um, maybe four personal projects in mind that I really want to pursue. I'm trying to narrow it down to two, but I'm, I'm kind of dabbling with three lately. Uh, this is one of them. The other one is like a character builder app. You guys might hear me talk about more of that in the future, but that's very concept art oriented. This one is very illustration oriented. And I feel like together, those things are very like, it's a good balance. I, I get my concept art with the other project and I get to kind of explore more story-based stuff with this one. So it's, uh, I don't actually remember if this was an answer to a question, but it's been like a lot of kind of self-discovery for, for this project. So I do like this project. I do want to continue it. Um, I think it's a good outlet for the kind of thing I want to do in the, in the more like story side of it. Yeah. I feel like knowing what the end goal, it's just like finding your style. I feel like having an, an end goal in mind is, is really important. Yeah. So what I'm going to do now think I keep saying it but I actually got to do it is we'll try to jump into color and um and lighting real quick so I'm, I may have to do like a really abridged version of both but yeah. um we can do some like really rough flat colors and then I'll I'll make sure to show you guys before we go today how I light this scene so what I got to do real quick is just mask these characters that's what I'm doing now I'm creating a clipping mask where I'm just gonna go through and again, like I said, everything's very rough at this point. So this mask does not need to be clean. It just needs to serve a very like loose purposes, something I can throw color onto in light. Yeah, that's a great technique. I think I learned that from you to have like a base color and then build onto it with like clipping mask. That's super helpful. Yeah, it's it's been, um, you know, I've worked with different methods over the years. Um, and I know when I first did this one, I think I, I went to experiment with other methods too, but I feel like I've come back to this one and I feel like it's, um, it's just something that seems very logical to me because you can kind of lay out every choice and then edit it easily if you need to. Uh, sometimes in the past I've painted very opaquely where I just go directly into it and I just start painting. I, I guess maybe a little bit more like you might if you're doing traditional painting, depending on the method. But yeah. um, I can always go back and I can change just the colors of this, or I can change just the lighting, or I can change specifically one light source. So I might have like my key light source different from my rim light source. And it just, I don't know, it allows me to really tweak any one aspect. If I look at the picture, I'm like, eh, it's not looking good. It's not working. I can kind of ask myself, is it the shape? Is it the base color? Is it the lighting in this area? And usually I can pick it out and it's easy to go back and, and tweak that. So it it makes sense to me at least when I do it and find that pretty helpful. Oh yeah, definitely. This is why I love digital painting. Yeah. Makes I don't life do a lot digital. easier. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I don't think I can go back because there's no color dodge layer in real life. <laughs> yeah. I, I do feel like it's kind of, it is fairly I mean, difficult. It's... Yeah, it's also jarring to think about it in the bigger picture. I know Wade always paints it and never tries to use the color dodge layer, which is, I mean, I don't think I would want to do that. <laughs> but that is that is definitely the way to go if I look at the bigger picture. Well, he's a because... better man than I, because I love color dodge. <laughs> I'll use it all day. Oh, man. <laughs> I don't have the strength to, to forego it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of work. Does anyone have but any... I feel like... Oh, go ahead. I was saying, uh, I feel like it's good to use like the tools at your disposal because this is why you're using these tools, right? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I, I really like traditional painting too. I, I've done it so little, but like 
I do enjoy it. It's a different process. I think there's something to be said about the tactile nature of it that's really satisfying. I think you just have to plan ahead more and kind of adjust your approach. But um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's so many great tools. I, I really like how digital painting allows you to just try things without limit. There's no, I got to wait for the paint to dry or, um, you know, if you just want to try slapping a photo on something and seeing how it looks with some texture, there's just no real limitations to if you want to do something, you can just do it. Yeah. I was going to say, um, does anyone have a favorite tool or like blending mode? Because I feel like multiply and color dodge are my, those are my two blending modes that are absolutely yeah. need them. I love them. I use them all the time. Same here. Multiply for shadows, color dodge for the highlights. Yeah. And I, I make so many adjustments with those two, like even in the middle yeah. of the painting, not even just setting up, um, the the initial block out which is what we're going to try to do but if i need to adjust something you know a lot of times those layers are the answer steve says puppy warp <laughs> what? i think you puppy mean warp. puppet warp <laughs> <laughs> he just gave away the new uh the new upcoming feature super yeah. secret puppy warp <laughs> next photoshop update <laughs> Overlay as well, yeah. Uh, Tanch says overlay, and I, I feel like, yeah, I think sometimes I use overlay as well. Overlay, okay. The smudge tool, nice. Smudge tool is great, yeah. Yeah. I use that quite a bit when painting. Do you ever use the smudge tool when uh, painting the portraits? <clears throat> I don't know, just a personal yeah. question. You do? Yeah, okay. a lot. Okay. Um. The, uh, have you seen those characters that I'm doing for the personal project, the character builder app thing? I have, I have, yes. That they're kind of like more realistic and smooth. Uh, I yep. use a lot of the smudge tool on those. Okay. Wade's like, yeah, do what you need to do to get it done. And he also uses color dodge for finishing touches. So, oh, we're good nice. then. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Wade. We can still be friends. Yep. <laughs> so sometimes um, I'll just know. draw with the, yeah. the shapes too, just if I want to imply, you know, details. Sorry, go ahead. Um, no, nothing. I was just saying that Dorina says overlay and multiply is the favorite. And then color dodge again. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, Laura, we will get into color dodge in just a bit. We're just blocking out the shapes and then we'll get into it. Oh, we'll get into color dodge already. <laughs> it's mandatory. Contractually obligated to talk about color dodge. Yeah. <laughs> um. So have you ever used Adobe Fresco for any of the work that you're doing right now? Like maybe concept <clears throat> art in Fresco? Um, I have. I, I haven't actually used done a, like a lot of painting uh on yeah. the ipad um i remember at one point this was like before you know uh covid and everything but i got the ipad sometime i don't know before that and i thought i was going to be on the go working a lot more and then that ended up not being the case so i haven't gotten like to the point where i can use it in my main workflow and be yeah. really fluid with it and everything and, and know how to handle every situation, but I've been kind of meaning to start dabbling with that more. Yeah, I feel like the live brushes and fresco are definitely yeah. something that, that is useful. And um, also, I guess it's just about the workflow. I mean, I never paint in Photoshop, but I feel like if I ever did and I got used to the shortcuts and hotkeys, I would never go back to fresco. Yeah, it's, it's tough when you get used to one thing and you kind of have to yeah. adapt to the more like gesture based way that the the iPad works and everything. Um, but I think like anything else, and like I said about tablets earlier, it, it just takes, you know, you kind of get used to whatever you use frequently, but I haven't jumped into it as much. Yeah, right. Fresco right. has shortcuts too. Yeah, yeah, let's get into it. Are we doing the color dodge now? Uh, not quite yet, we will get to that. Um, first, I kind of have to think about uh, like I was showing with this, where is it? 
Oh, here it is. Um, the the general layout and, and coloration of everything. And um, this one's pretty straightforward since we have a, a background here. But what I was doing a lot, I guess I showed it here, is it's just simple dark shape for the characters. There's a little bit of lighting, but then a, a gradient background. So I try to... I try to put down like the most simple thing um, and not, not get into painting detailed too early. So I try to do that off the bat and try to show what the image might look like with as little detail as possible. So I often find that gradients are good for that. So let's do, let's do the background. We'll do new layer. And I'm, I'm kind of trying to picture like, okay, what does this environment look like? They're out here in front of a cave. The light would maybe be hitting the ground and not so much the uh, the cave, the cave wall as much. Maybe you'd be hitting like certain rocks that are more vertical. So then we got this shot, which is the one we're working with now. And this doesn't always work, but sometimes I just try to look at it and visualize like what might the um, lighting look like. And I kind of have like a an idea now, so try that yeah. brian in the chat wants to know which shade of maroon should i use <laughs> i don't know if that's rhetorical but like <laughs> hey it's, it's outside my pay uh, pay grade <laughs> i barely know what maroon is yeah a lot of the right? colors the, a lot of the names of the colors i'm going to admit i don't know when people use specific names for colors i'm just like sometimes i know them sometimes i don't yeah, and now now there are like multiple apps that you can use to name your colors. So that's very confusing. <laughs> I will say though, I do know what maroon is. All right. <laughs> yeah, I don't want any joke. rumors started. We, we were just kidding. <laughs> I totally know what that is. All right, so I'm gonna try to get like this general gradient of they're outside this cave, so there's gonna be maybe some light hitting the ground, bouncing up. Um, the light may not be hitting the front of the cave quite as much, but also we have a dark shape to worry about. And that's the cave entrance here. Oh. And I haven't really determined like is, cause this is going to play into it is if this is a dark shape in the background, then is that going to affect, you know, does the character need to be brighter? So yeah. I'm not sure I'm going to have to kind of figure that out, but this is, this is the whole point of just kind of, you know, roughing this stuff in, um, seeing if, if I need to make any fundamental changes. Yeah, for sure. Um, I just want to remind everybody that we have about 40 minutes left in the broadcast. And if you're watching this on YouTube, hop on over to be.net slash Adobe live. This is where the chat is. This is where the fun is. So hop on over. Let's let's talk. <laughs> you can ask Sam about all the colors. Don't ask me about colors. Oh, I don't, Evan's, I don't know anything about colors. Evan's popping in all the color names <laughs> and I'm not even going to try. Hey, this guy knows colors. Look at him showing off. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so I'm kind of like, now that I have this cave entrance knocked in, I'm kind of picturing for whatever reason, this slope that is kind of implied in the sketch catching light. And then this area here being more in shadow. So I'm going to see if I can, can illustrate that roughly. Like, I don't know. A lot of times the, the sketches, it's kind of like implied detail. So my brain is kind of filling in these gaps. And then I try to latch onto one of those things sometimes and uh, see if I can kind of make it work. So I don't know if the, the light would be more like that. Yeah, maybe that looks pretty good. And again, you know, if I can illustrate these in, in really rough gradients, uh, that's what I'm gonna try to do. Also, thinking of a direction the lighting come, is coming from is very important. So, what was I visualizing yeah. here? I don't I know if it would like... be around noon, maybe? 
Um, I'm sorry, I missed that. Oh, I was just saying, I don't know if it's going to be like midday. I kind of need to figure that out. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm like, oh, wait, what? It's noon already? I was a little distracted there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Time zones are hard. It's it's <laughs> midnight here. So time zones are oh, hard. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> still morning here. It's still morning here as well. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, and we do not have any artist spotlight today. Um, and this is a one of one session, but you can always catch Sam on Behance and Twitch as well. So um, I, I believe Sam will be continuing the storyboard animation illustrations there. So yeah, that is a continuation. So once we get done for today, you can always go over to Sam's profile. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm streaming a lot. Yeah. <clears throat> The fanciest color name I know is Cyan. <laughs> yeah, that's my <laughs> level right there. It's critical for any fantasy story to have overly verbose color names. I like it. <laughs> Easy sophistication. Yeah, Azure, Cerulean. Okay, that is that is cerulean. out of out of bounds. I don't actually know what Cerulean is, but it's it's a good word. I like it. It's a good word, definitely. I think oh, this is the a- consequence of being raised on photoshop as an artist is like i don't have the paint tube names to go off of um i just have like oh it's more (laughs) shift the hue this way shift the saturation this way shift the value (laughs) this way and that is how i think about colors i mean that's not a bad way to go about it anyway so yeah it's just less like i don't know it's just kind of random it's hard to describe like oh it's a desaturated dark red you know without giving them value uh, <laughs> metrics. I see what you did there. De- desaturated dark red. I see. I see. <laughs> oh, I really like how this cave uh, is coming up. Yeah, I I'm, I'm, wasn't really planning on doing this, but I'm just like, eh, it's kind of fun. But we got to get... Did... Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, it just helps give context to the characters as well. Like having yeah. a background. I think that's the thing is I at least have to knock it in roughly so that like everything else, the context is there because if I were to do everything and then I put in the background and there was no hint of this and it changed it too much, I think that would be a mistake because I'd be like, oh, now the image is fundamentally changed and the stuff I painted and drew no longer works the same way or looks the same way. So I try to get all the context in there. Again, um, even if it's super rough. Yeah, definitely helps. There, so now it's like, ah, we got some some rocks in place. Um, they're supposed to be standing in front of a cave, so, you know, I thought this be a good thing to try here. All right, and now we can try some color on the characters. I think this is good enough for a placeholder for our cave. And um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna group my background, control G and just do background. And then we got our characters here. So what I'm gonna do with the characters is um, create a new layer. And this is gonna be our flat colors. It's just a normal layer name it flat colors and I will right click this or you can do um you can do alt and put your cursor between the two layers for a clipping mask and click or you can right click it and do create clipping mask so now that is clipped to these this shape uh, this flat shape that I created and this is where we can just grab a brush and play around with some uh quick color ideas some cerulean in there it's a shade of blue (laughs) I googled it Oh, okay. Cerulean. All right. I don't know. That sounds like, that sounds about right. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't be outing myself that I don't know colors, <laughs> uh, color names. Oh, we were just kidding. What are you talking about, Sam? I already yeah, said it. It's a, it's yeah. a gag, guys. I know all of them. Yeah. Funny joke. <laughs> so I'm thinking this one maybe can be more, hmm, I was thinking more earth toned. Yeah, and I'm trying to picture which one would make sense to be more colorful. I feel like the the thin one, the thin guy, seems like maybe him having more colors would be 
Yeah, uh, I feel like that would play nicely with the dark entrance to the cave. Oh, well. yeah, that's a good point. So what I like to do is just kind of freely scribble colors down. Again, this is all placeholder. I'm trying to show you guys like phase. I guess it's not even going to be phase two of three. There's like the, you know, napkin sketch phase, the color and lighting block in, and then um, the finished. This is probably going to be like phase, you know, just before two. But uh, this is what I like to do sometimes, just freely scribble colors. I don't like being too clean with it. So I, I enjoy even taking off the lines sometimes if I need to. And just allowing myself to uh, scribble it out like I'm trying to find a color palette on canvas. Like if you're working in oil paint or something and and you're kind of throwing in different colors on the canvas, trying to tone it, trying to find like a, almost like a mood and a feel for it. I, I like to do that just with, you know, throwing down whatever colors I feel like. So let's uh, revisit the, uh, what is it? Agama, Agama, Agama Gecko or a lizard, that thing looks pretty neat. It's got like orange head and like a blue body, which is kind of an interesting complementary color contrast there. And then um, oftentimes after that, I will bring back the lines just to add in context if I need to. Maybe he's kind of got like these reddish patches. Maybe his underside is um, orange. And the other part is blue. That could be kind of neat. And like little bits of red. Yeah, sometimes I feel like we limit ourselves by turning on the sketch too much. Yeah, I feel like sometimes it makes me want to get really small and be like, all right, so then I got to do clean. And I'll do that kind of after, but I like being able to see the palette first. And I don't know, this is like doing stuff like this is like one of my favorite parts of it. So if I can just kind of get the feel for what the... Um, whole thing might look like I think that's helpful Evan says color names no vibes only <laughs> vibes yeah that's what I'm going for I'm trying to find the perfect vibe you can't name it you know yeah it's just gotta be <laughs> it's just gotta be it I'll know it when I feel it no I mean an actual color tip that I would say I do keep in mind is keeping it simple, like choosing one color at a time, like a dominant color. So I guess in this guy's case, it would be the red and then secondary color, which is like his underbelly and, um, you know, parts of his body is like this more orange. And then he's got a lot of leather and piecemeal gear and just kind of like brownish tones. So keeping it very simple, if I start adding in too many colors, it's going to get really messy really quick it's also going to be really intimidating to try to approach this piece so i try to keep it um limited colors and slowly add in more and more as i feel like i actually need to yeah everybody love everybody is loving the process for the colors that's pretty neat brand yeah, says they like the lighter color belly and darker back like a lizard yeah that's what we're going for, I think. Yeah, and I, I'm adding in the red, but I'm quickly finding that that's starting to look like the character on the left. So maybe if we do like a, what if we did a darker blue? You know, kind of the darker back, like they were mentioning, but more of a blue color. And this just allows me to change things really quickly again, like every stage of the process. This is not like the finished sketch. I'm going to probably yeah. work up these lines a lot more. This hand is just a blob. Um, so I'll probably actually draw out a proper hand and stuff like that. But it's very possible I may scrap that pose altogether and do something else. Probably won't because I think it's working okay. But 
I try to give myself the, the option to change anything drastically at any point. Yeah, I love that just adding a bit of color has completely changed how it looked from the color block in. Like mm -hmm. the mask, Claire. And we may um, we may leave this guy unfinished. I don't feel like I'm quite hitting the mark with him. But uh, this guy on the left, he's he's okay. I think he uh, he'll be ready for a lighting pass pretty soon. And then it's very possible we might have to do something with the background too, since it's a little bit um, too too white, I think. Yeah, I think you're right now that you mention it. Wade in the chat says, hey, Sam, which is <coughs> up glasses. Don't kobolds actually have tails? Oh, man. <laughs> Wade's here to save the day. Thanks, Wade. That's, that's actually a very good point. Thank you. I appreciate that. We will add tails because, yes, yes, they do. I don't hey, know thanks, why. Hey, thanks, Wade. Do this is why Wade is the best moderator in town. That's why we... Uh, keep wait around for these important details you can uh you know continu continuity i don't know why that's a hard word for me to say fact checking my uh my fantasy flaws here <laughs> maybe i'll kind of like taper off the edge here i don't want to make it dark but i feel like maybe we should have a bit of a gradient kind of bring that oh, yeah the eye over here more. And even though I'm trying to keep it pretty gradient um, focused, sometimes it's fun to play with some textured brushes and kind of put some shadow under them and try some stuff with that. I'm trying to think like if there's a shadow from the hill next to them. Ooh, Wade coming in hot with all the tips. Wade's like could also be a good distinguishing characteristic. Oh, that's true. Yeah, like the the shape and, and length of the tail. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very good point. So um in regard to the question uh to the hand and changing how it looks right now, we have a question which says once you've finished the hand, do you copy that and tweak it to change a position or do you redraw the whole hand? Um I'm not sure if they mean for like the different shots, but uh this is mostly just gonna be a static image. And then I may have to do like a an arm change. So if I go into the storyboard. The horizontal images indicate a uh, animation with within that frame. So <clears throat> for this one, he whips his head to the side to talk to him. So that head change goes. Um, yeah. And then he pulls out a bow in this one. So basically, I would just use the same illustration and then crop off the head and redraw it. I'm not sure if that's what they mean, but it's not frame by frame animation. So I don't really have to change things often. Yeah, I feel like um, there's maybe regard in in reference to the sketch layer, and you're oh. redrawing it. Oh, I see. Um, yeah. I would probably go with a new layer. Yeah. Uh, since this one is so rough, it'd probably be easier just to to draw like a, a new layer over it completely. I don't always do that, but it's kind of a case by case basis, and that's probably what I would do in this instance. Yeah. And Evan is has a very pressing question. Do yeah. kobolds lose their tails like a gecko? That's oh, interesting. Oh, man. <laughs> that is interesting. <laughs> I don't think so. I've never heard that, but that would be like a cool thing to put in a game. You know, if you're, if you're a character, if you can like play a kobold or if, if there's yeah. a kobold NPC that's important, you know, like they get away because they, and they lost their tail and some sort of creature started chasing it yeah i like oh, it oh man yeah and tails regrow i mean what if the kobolds regrew regrew yeah and then, <laughs> and then when they're growing their tail it's like when you're growing your hair out like there's the awkward phase where it doesn't yeah. really like look good 
So all the other kobolds are making fun of his like stubby tail that's only, you know, only like a fraction of how long it's supposed to be. It's just really yeah. embarrassing for him. <laughs> Fun. Wade says this is um he's he's a he's built to mod anything DD based. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite in love with this um coloration of the blue one but uh i don't know i'm wondering if i should add more shades of blue in like this this lizard has there's some areas where it's dark blue but there's some areas kind of well, that's pretty cool actually where it's it's almost more of like this bright blue yeah maybe around the the limbs yeah i feel like that would be really helpful um indicating the light source as well yeah i'll we'll have to think about the coloration of this guy but i may have to leave him alone and then we can uh we can jump into lighting real quick so again this is what i like doing about this process is at any point i can leave it i can say okay let's move on and then i can come back to it with no you know no consequence it's not like i have to redo something um so because these are all on separate layers i can always come back to this which i think I will do. So yeah, yeah there's a very rough block out. Don't forget to save, Sam. Oh yeah, I just did. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad. Yeah. I'm here for the reminder. Save your work, guys. <laughs> if you're lurking and working, save your work. Yeah, get that muscle memory down. All right. So this is uh, the multiply layer. And I approach this slightly differently sometimes, but... I'm going to choose a desaturated bluish reddish color. Uh, well, I guess that is purple. <laughs> I guess you would call that purple. Um, I call it bluish reddish color. And uh, something yeah. that just looks good. Sometimes if it's too saturated, it's going to look, you know, very cool, very um, purpley. But I just try to find a tone that looks like they're in shadow. And that looks pretty decent to me. So I'm going to leave that. And now we're going to do the mythical color dodge. Mythical color dodge arrives. Um, so is that just like a simple bluish reddish layer that you added in as a solid color in the form of a multiply layer? Yeah. Yeah. So I just okay. filled that in with the paint bucket tool. Sometimes I'll actually paint it in and I can yeah. show you that really quick. But lately, um, I just put the flat colors in as like local mid-tone colors, which makes sense to me. And then I darken them all down so I can put in some lighting. But in the past, also what I've done is just like, you can take a hard brush. And so let's say the lighting is coming from the top left or something. You know, I can yeah. kind of sketch this on the underside, wherever we would have shadow. And already we, we kind of have this like, lighting effect a little bit but you know that works too um and that's i've done that in the past but what i've been doing lately is just filling it all in and then we take a color dodge layer and yeah. instead of painting in the shadow we paint in the light essentially so let's try um i always pick like a warmish color so this uh sort of orange tone and then fairly fairly dark because color dodge is really potent um, but desaturated again, and I'll try around that level of, of value, maybe like, I don't know, one third from black and, uh, try this out. So this, I'm going to actually crank that up a little bit, you know, just adjust it as I need to. So do you have any tips about uh, the kind of colors you use for color dodge? I mean, this is definitely the tones that we're using here, but um, just in general. Yeah, yeah. So I use um, this kind of orange desaturated color. It's always desaturated because as soon as you start putting some saturation in it, uh, you're gonna yeah. you're gonna notice it pretty dramatically. Like it kind of makes it neon. Uh, mm -hmm. But I use a cool color if I want a cool lighting. So. And, um, you know, in sunlight or something like that, obviously it's going to be a warm tone. But if you have any situation where you want like a cool light being cast on them, uh, you can pick like a, maybe a bluish green and it's going to yeah. change it subtly. Let's darken that down a bit. But like when you put the light source on this way, 
once you block it out and get it all in there, especially if you kind of have the shadows a little bit warmer to contrast, because there's that whole rule of thumb, which is if it's a cool light, it's a warm shadow. And if it's a warm light, it's a cool shadow. So if you kind of get those two things in, you know, the lighting starts to look a little bit um, colder and it, it can be kind of an interesting effect. Uh, but in this situation, we're going to do a warm light. So I kind of orange yellowish. So this is going to be my key light. I may actually call it that because um, I like to set up different light sources sometimes depending on the situation. Awesome. Then, yeah, we have uh, about 15 <coughs> minutes left for today. Okay. So just a reminder. So I kind of have to decide, is the light coming from top, directly from the top is kind of boring. Um, left or right, I guess is what it is. So it would be on his back and his front or his back and his front. Um, and we can, we can alternate and try different things. That's the fun thing about this um, this method. Yeah, is you can do it pretty quick, just to try out different light source. <clears throat> so I'm going to try it coming from the right side. So it's mostly on his front and his back. Steve says perhaps there's a fire nearby. Yeah, that could be a fun light source. Oh, like a little, yeah, a little campfire. Yeah. So again, you know, this is super rough, but it helps me kind of determine like, is this, is this a good direction? Do I want to pursue this? And if I do, I can just go in and clean it up and refine it. Also, if I really want to choose this and start refining things like the line drawing and refine the, um, uh, the, you know, each each layer, essentially each series of layers. It's uh, it's a good time to kind of get reference. You know, if I want to take like a reference pose or photos for myself or look up reference photos just to really nail this down, because once I go back into this, that's where I'm really making that decision on like this is the pose I'm choosing and I, I want to get it right. So um it kind of allows me to take a step back and be like, all right, I've decided on this. Let's take a reference for it, gather references, whatever I need. Yeah, definitely. References really help um, applying yeah. into, into the process in a way that you're not exactly copying the reference, but looking at it, I guess, optically. I don't know. I don't know how to put it. Yeah. I mean, there's different ways. Objectively. To do it, it... Objectively. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's really just trying to like inform what you've already sketched, you know, because the idea is there. I already have established that. But if there's anything that's lacking information or I want to make it better, um, you know, that's the time to do it. So I'm going to put a little bit of light hitting that lower lip, just defining some of these features a little bit, shadow for the eye. And the, the goal for me is to um, basically be able to, you know, zoom out, look at this and be like, is this a successful shot? Will this work? And already, yeah. I feel like I'm kind of getting that information. Uh, there's more lighting layers to do. But uh, I already have a pretty good feel for how this image might look. So once you have like the light source and everything blocked out, do you work on the same layers or do you create more layers for the, for the details? Um, I have each layer separate. So I'll keep yeah. the, I'll keep the key light. I mean, this is my color dodge key light layer. I'll keep that. Um, I'll keep any other shadows and, and lighting layers I have, but then once that's all blocked in and I like it and, you know, I'll go in and refine it too on the same layer. I just use one layer, but I'll go in and like carve these shapes out and make it more accurate. Uh, but once all that's in place, I'll just make a um, a new layer and I'll paint on top of it. So I'll paint over this all opaquely and then yeah. go from there. But um, I try to keep all the layers <clears throat> separated and I save them. 
the OG layers that I have, I'll, I'll merge these at some point, but I like to back them up. So I put them into their own folder for the original layers and then uh, paint over it all. Awesome. Never knew that. <clears throat> we learn new things every day. Yeah, it helps to be able to merge at some point, but that's when I don't really need to be able to access all the layers anymore. Once I've committed to it and I know that I like it. Wade saying one layer squad. Yeah. I'm not there yet, but I'm trying. I've been practicing portraits lately, um, being inspired by you and your um, characters. And I've picked up quite a few things. I've realized that over time. And I started practicing. And like using one layer definitely has its advantages because you don't have to worry about a lot of things. And that kind of takes the stress away from actually painting. I mean, worrying about if it's going to look good instead of actually trying to paint. I don't know if that makes sense. Did I say that right? Um, yeah. And I, I think the thing is I never really use one layer in a way where it's risky. So I'll merge things down yeah. and that way I can edit the silhouette if I need to. So if I need to carve into this shape, I can do that. Um, I can warp things. I can move them around. But anytime I just start painting, I make a new layer. Yeah. And so I'll do everything on a new layer so I'm not destroying anything. And then I can edit that one layer. And if it looks good, I'll merge it down again. I'll be like, I like those changes, merge them down, new layer, do it again and again. So keeping the merge down just allows me to make big changes to the silhouette and you know any, any dramatic shapes I wanna change. Uh, otherwise, when things are all on different layers, you have to change it on each layer and it's very time consuming. Yeah, exactly. We degrees again. Multiple so, layers. Love I it. think I think we're through most of it. Um a lot of it's cleaning up. Something I'll do here is an ambient occlusion layer, which is just another multiply layer, but it's just a different purpose where essentially what I'll do. I'll get another shadow tone. And if I need, this isn't really the time for it because we're so rough and ambient occlusion is usually a layer that I do more carefully. It's more of like a finish stage. Yeah. But just to show you, it's- um, Bonus content. Yeah, it's those, uh, those shadows that are supposed to be really dark like where crevices are. Where, where objects overlap, where they sit on top of each other, the darkest kind of shadows where things don't get into. So it helps when I have the flat colors cleaned up more because I can just yeah. select them and use that as a base right now. You see me using the uh, lasso tool, but I can use the yeah. magic wand tool. Like if we pretend this is a clean piece, I can go to my flat colors, grab that shape with the magic wand tool. Mm -hmm. And since it's a really rough shape, uh, it's not going to look good, but control shift I to inverse my selection. And I can just kind of do the shadow underneath where that's, you know, falling on top of the body here. Very so, handy technique. So that's more of like a, a fine tuning, but uh, that's another type of layer I do. Um, <clears throat> this isn't really necessary because of this. Uh, this scene doesn't call for it, but if I do another color dodge layer, I could do yeah. a rim light. And the only thing different with a rim light, or sorry, I said color dodge layer, um, a linear dodge is what mm -hmm. I've used for that. So if you want to see maybe how I would do a rim light. How sure would you say flips. rim light is different from key light? How would you differentiate that? So key light, um, I mean, if you look up like light setups for photography, you'll probably see it, but I think there's typically a key light, which is the main light source. Like for me, I have a soft box, you know, hitting me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Rim light would be if I had a light behind me, that's kind of like, I think they're also called a hair light where it kind of okay. separates you from the background. Yeah. And um, then there's also like a fill, a fill light. So if I have a key light on my right side of my face and my left is in shadow, you may have a fill light to bounce a little bit of light back in there. So I use those when I need them. Um, in this one, I probably, well, I definitely don't need a rim light, but I'll use a linear dodge because it's uh, it's more consistent color across different colors of the body. So yeah, 
Uh, the color dodge is is affected a little bit too much by the colors beneath it for that to work well, but that's kind of the rim light. You know, if I wanted that, I'll just hit that on the edge. And then um, a fill light, I actually might do a fill light and that would just be a color dodge layer here. And what I would probably do for this shot, I'm, I'm certainly gonna use this, I imagine, is I would go to a warm color and maybe bounce some light up into the shadows um, because the light is going to be bouncing off the sand and up into okay. their shadows. So you'll you'll probably see that in like beach photography or something. There's a, like a warm underglow you see a lot at the beach and that's because yeah. of that bounced light. So in these shadows in here, let's see. <clears throat> yeah, that's kind um, of like a warm underpainting to the actual painting <laughs> yeah and it, it would just soften up the shadows around the legs uh probably yeah. make them look a bit more realistic uh i think it's a little bit early for this to be a really necessary layer but it's certainly something i'm going to be using um to make it look like there's this sort of uh warm glow from underneath Looks amazing. I wouldn't have even thought of the bounce light for the sand. Yeah. And I like to keep those all on different layers because it just makes my life easier. But that's kind of the rough in. Um, yeah. The thing about this is I can go in at any point and determine, like, do I need to change something? Is the shape not working? Is the colors, the lighting, whatever it may be. And um, for this guy, like, maybe I want to give him a longer beard. Like maybe that's a distinguishing part of his character, you know. It's like he has this kind of dragony beard hanging off. That's um, fun. So I can kind of choose anything that I need think needs attention. But at this point, if I like all the colors and lighting, I'd probably go in and start fix fixing up the drawing. Yeah, Brian says rim light is equal to hair light is hard edge thin line. Yeah, that's a way to remember it. Definitely. Love that. Yeah. So we have um, about five minutes left for today. So I guess we should uh, go back to giving a recap of what we did today. But if you guys missed it, you can always watch the stream on replay at the Adobe Creative Cloud YouTube channel and also on Behance. It will be archived forever. And uh, yeah, let's do a quick recap and then we can dive into where we can find Sam and how you can reach out or watch more streams. Yeah, sounds good. Um I was just going to say, here's a good example of the rim light. You can see that kind of cool lighting on the edge there. So it's just kind of like there's light peeking in from behind them somewhere else. So a lot of rim light in this shot. Um, yeah. But I'm going to exercise restraint and not use it in this new one because it's uh, <laughs> there would be no rim light. It wouldn't really make sense. <clears throat> so a little recap if anyone's just joining or hasn't seen it. Um, I'm doing an animation project with two people I met from TikTok. Cinderblock Sally is primarily the writer, and then we have Double Crit Fail, primarily the animator on this project, and I am primarily doing the art and illustration. So this is the first one. Um, if you guys are watching it now, you can go to the beginning, replay the little animatic that I played. This will hopefully be done and out soon. If you follow me on social media, Sam Peterson Art on um, Instagram, Sam Peterson Art on Twitter, uh, those are probably the places you would hear it announced. Maybe I can throw it up on Behance too when it's when it's done. But um, we're, we have a YouTube channel for that, and I'll let you guys know when we when we launch it. But this is the second script I've been doing here, and this is called Innocent Monsters. So we'll have two once this is done. But this is there's going to be a lot of work ahead of this one. This one I'm hoping will be wrapped up pretty soon. And I've just been trying to show you how I go around uh, blocking out a scene basically taking it from the napkin doodle phase right here that you're seeing and throwing in some colors, some values, just to see uh, if that works in terms of um, kind of like blocking out the scene and, and just getting a rough feel for what it will look like. Yeah. And that's, um, uh, that's pretty much it. That's a wrap. Um, if you could go over the layers that we created, that would be great. Yeah, that's yeah, great. good idea. Um, yeah, so, we can see the progression of things. Yeah, a quick recap of the layers would be, let's see, let's turn all these off. Uh, the background is just painted, but 
originally I do a really quick doodle so I can throw in a mask. So I create a mask. We can take the lines off so you can see what that looks like. And then flat colors, which is a normal layer. Yeah. And then we have a multiply layer where I fill in the whole thing with a multiply layer um, with like a kind of a desaturated bluish color that's not too dark. And then an ambient occlusion layer uh, for the fill light. Or I'm sorry, for the, where's my key light layer? There we go. I didn't name it key light. This is an ambient, uh, sorry, a color dodge layer for the key light. And then that's pretty much it. Um, fill light is just another color dodge. So pretty much multiply for shadows and color dodge for light source. And yeah. that is what we are left with. Awesome. Um, I want to say thank you, Sam, for joining us. This has been amazing and I would love to see more of the process. So if you guys want to watch the continuation of this storyboard animation illustration, you can follow Sam everywhere. Go follow Sam Peterson Art on Behance, Twitch and Twitter, you guys. And also Instagram, don't forget. Um, I want to say thank you to everyone in chat. Thanks so much for joining us and uh, stay tuned for the Illustrator Daily Creative Challenge with Andrew Hawkradle up next. Um, immediately followed by video editing with Dotford. Thanks so much and have a great day, you guys. Thanks for joining Bye. everyone. Bye.